What is up down and sideways, you beautiful individuals? We have returned. It's League Unlocked. Eric and Mark here with you beauties. And for any of you, myself included, going into day three of the bracket stage, PSG versus BLG, the general consensus was this is going to be the biggest blow. We've already had two three zeros. This is going to be the biggest stomp, probably the least exciting series of this opening round. And all of us were completely wrong about that one. Everybody got the read wrong. Everyone was thinking that, oh man, here comes PSG. They are going to get obliterated at this stage. Not only are they matching up against the number one seed in the LPL, not only it's also the one team that a lot of people are identifying as the team at this MSI, this home crowd advantage as well for them. And it's PSG with the debuff. A lot of people saying you only beat FlyQuest. There's no way you're going to be able to hang in this water. I got news for you. They were able to hang. They were able to push it more than just hanging into a decisive game five. It didn't look like they were going to hang in this series in game one. It looked like this is okay. We're going to be going for maybe a sub hour series uh, with how quickly BLG were able to take this one over. And it was most of the games had a lane swap of some point in this series, but I swear they're getting shorter and shorter. They seem to be just till guys are level two and then they're running back bot lane. It's just, just a sampling of the lane swap is how we feel about the, the early taste in this game was one of the things, and but I, you know what? I think for BLG, it made a lot of sense to move into that quick transition from the early little advantages that you had. You had more than enough that you could push that snowball off the hill and have it roll all the way through, picking up that momentum. That's exactly what this game one was. It was momentum picking straight up through Elk, through uh, Knight in the mid lane, and of course, Giga Bin making sure he's fell. Yeah, it was it was kind of just a flex from BLG, winning team fights, 2v3 scenarios that they had no business winning. That was kind of the theme of that first game as they jump out to a 1-0 lead. And game two, again, started by following the pace because Elk and On, I think at one point it was almost a 3k gold lead just in the AD carry spot because this Callista became absolutely out of control. And a 3k gold lead on a lethality Callista? Yeah, you're doing a lot of damage and you're feeling a lot of pain on the side of PSG coming through from Elk gotta be careful because if you play lethality Callista and you let it slip you get off that gas pedal one little bit and you have some scaling on the other side that's gonna shift mighty fast and that's exactly what we had here despite the over 7,000 gold lead for BLG it's PSG finding the fight it's the, the Maokai it's the Aurelian soul from Mr. Maple finding that damage picking up those stacks picking up that scaling and that's a problem on the side of BLG in this composition. Yeah, that pivotal comeback ace, it comes in, the hex gates, and BLG say, ha, 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 we're sitting there waiting for a Maokai and a Cassante, which they burn all their cooldowns on, can't kill them because they're both unkillable. And yeah, Aurelian Soul for uh, Maple alongside Lucian by Betty, able to clean it up. And they're right by the Baron, and credit to PSG, this one term fight, team fight, completely flips the game on its head and they don't look back. It's There's zero hesitation on that moment, right? That pivotal moment where you feel like you can, all of a sudden, we can take control of this game. We can dictate what's happening here. We can start to change the parameters of how you are able to play out this game because we have the strength. That was absolutely the crucial moment. And that execution on that later on throughout this game too, Shows that PSG's for real. They're a legit team. They've absolutely got the skills, got the mental uh, strength capable of handling this type of event and handling a team like BLG. And that only gets doubled down to kick off game three, which is almost the rev the inverse of what we get out of game two. Elk is starting zero and four on the Lucian because Betty is absolutely styling on the Zeri. He's feeling it. He's flashing tidal waves nonstop. It's a seven to one start for PSG. And you hear the cast already saying, PSG's here. They're the unknown. We're flipping MSI on its head. And less than five minutes later, BLG has turned the entire game around and it's killing the Nexus. 
a little something called Mr. Knight on Talia uh, entered the game and had his effect is the problem at that type of point as well. You can you throw in Jun on the Wukong and this is rare because there was not a lot of things that you want to be talking about with Jun in this game, or should I say, a lot of things you're talking about with Jun in this series in a positive light is this the kind way to put that one. But this game, this was one of those ones where he had the effect. He had the positive mojo going for the side of BLG. And you laid it out. Not only were those, uh, you know, you have, of course, Talia from Night coming through and the Wukong in the jungle, but eventually Elk starts to get online and is a factor later on in this game that ability to stay in it, stay locked in, and be able to deliver when it counts in this one. After the collapse of game two and the way that this game three started, you love to see that from BLG. We got ourselves a brawl. It doesn't matter if he starts 0-4, he's always gonna have the CS numbers, and as soon as he's ignored in a team fight, you know Elk's gonna be able uh, to take over. But this was the first game where there wasn't a lane swap, and you saw Elk and On get behind that huge deficit because um, Betty and Woody were playing so well with that Zeri Lulu bot lane. But even though they look so good in the early game, it's BLG who takes the 2 1 series lead and you say, ah, that's probably it for PSG. The momentum is broken up. Oh my god, we got Vayne for Bin in game four. There's no way that PSG can force that silver scrapes. But again, at a deficit, this time it's only about 3.5k, but around the Baron Pit. They come in to contest against BLG, and this, to me, is the first glaring example of the buff to Baron's damage that we got to see at MSI. We've been waiting. We've been waiting so long to see this. This is some of the things that we talked about with the changes coming through this year, specifically the ones for Baron and how it was going to be when we expect to see more impactful fights around there dictated by what Baron is doing, how much of a, a nuisance it can be and what it can do to these health bars. You see it in this fight. That's a crucial one there. And you also have to factor in, and I don't think a lot of teams did this or necessarily to the amount that they should have, the team fighting cohesion from this PSG team. They are absolutely fantastic at it. And that is one of the big tickets of why this game four does swing back the way of PSG. They find themselves the control and we get the unthinkable silver scrapes against BLG from Mr. Wildcard Region PSG. Buckle up. The confidence from both Maple and Betty that you saw, especially in that fight around Baron, but in game four, that was the LCS's TSM Maple Talia that we were seeing on the rift. That's the maple that has made his international name known across all these regions, all this time. That is that player coming through, that class eternal. It really is fantastic to see him performing at this type of way because again, last time we saw Maple out in an international event, some question marks, some slippery performances against the LEC. Now we see him up against the number one team in the LPL and not just that, the number one mid laner in the LPL in night. And he's going toe to toe. He's taking the leading reins for PSG. Game five, Silver Scrapes, dial it up. Unfortunately, I guess BLG in between game four and five, going back to their green room, they looked out at the crowd. They saw all the BLG jerseys, all their colors being represented. Jun just imagined what the online community would be saying about his performance. So they come back for game five, he says, Give me the Kindred, we're done messing around, and it was the most dominant game of the series. It was another lane swap, but Jun's Kindred was all over the map early, and the Udyr pick out of Aji, not what I wanted to see in Game 5. I, I don't know how this equation works out all the time, but we always seem to get these series that are maybe not even close to being competitive. They're, you know, blow out game one, blow out game two, and it's, you know, for both sides. And then all of a sudden game five is the one where you get a really tense, tight, you know, pressure game. And there's other times you get series like this, where you do get these swings and you do get this kind of even showing. And then all of a sudden game five is a massive blowout in the favor of one of these teams. And that's BLG coming on through strong and specifically Yes, he's had some incredibly poor moments in this series. That's something we didn't really talk about throughout these wins for PSG is there were a lot of those mistakes and a lot of those mistakes owned up to Jun on the side of BLG. 
he was clutch in this game five with a mega performance for his team. And, you know, all you can do is still salute PSG for playing such an unbelievably competitive series when nobody was expecting them to, proving they deserve to be on this main stage. And I guarantee you, FlyQuest wouldn't have put together a series like this against BLG. And I don't think there would have been the preparation that would have had to go into it the way that PSG did. And then never mind the way that they were able to stay into this series and the resilience of it. I don't see that coming through from the LCS at this point, which is a shame, frankly, because this is the PSG. This is the type of format that you know these wild card region teams, when they're able to stick around, they're able to level up, able to gain something from these events. This is the type of thing that you lead and want to see from it at the end of the day, not the, P the FlyQuest run that we got to see or even the Team Liquid matchup. And that run's not even over yet and we're already sweating. But uh, the other biggest number, biggest stat from this series, Mr. Cassante, five and zero in this series. Mark, why don't we see this dude banned more? Uh, there has to be a problem in the valuation of these teams and how they're going through the draft at this point. The priority taken away from the Cassante ban, getting him out of the game, making sure that that's not the thorn, just hassle that you have to deal with, the overloaded nature and overpoweredness of that champion. A lot of the things we're seeing in these drafts is identifying on not only a lot of these powerful AD champions, right? The ADCs down in that bottom lane, but really, it's about the specifics on who you're playing. I think people have identified, of course, we're in right away to best of fives and what best of series can do with little pocket picks, little strengths and, and whatnot. And they're taking that to, to heart and banning it out and banning these things. But that leaves things like the Cassante up. And leaving that up is a dangerous game to play. And you see that in this series where under the radar with all these other things, all these other flashy things, more, you know, kind of things you think are more key. You get that Cassante coming through. And what was his win rate in this series? You don't want to know. That's the secret. And it's close to 100 percent. It feels like even in other series. And when you're looking at the split as a whole, one final matchup for round one of the bracket stage probably thought T1 versus G2 was going to be your best bet for a banger series, but PSG has already delivered that. Now I'm thinking, ah, really, that was a bit of copium. Can G2 actually compete with T1? The only way I see them making this a competitive series is if they are channeling that inner 2019. They need an MVP level performance out of caps, and they need to break up what has already started to become a kind of stale meta. Yeah, that's the big ticket. That's the question, though, is whether it's going to actually be G2 that has that read, has their own take on the meta, their own flavor, or is it T1? Because we know T1 likes to cook up their own meta and, and take certain things from it. We didn't necessarily see that uh, at all through the slight glimpse that we had through them in play-ins, of course, and, and understandably so, keeping a couple things close to the chest before this main stage. This is an exciting matchup. I think especially after the way that these opening matches have gone in this best of, uh, you know, best of five for this new part of, of MSI, this one, the history between these teams, the history between some of these players, and then the history that doesn't exist between some of these players looking at the likes of Yike in the jungle. You're talking about how you can find that edge. I think that he is someone that absolutely can provide that firepower, can be that X factor. If he's on the top of his game, on the top of that snowball performance for G2, that is a ticket to victory. If I'm G2, I'm lane swapping every game, number one, to avoid the 2v2 early in the bot lane. And because Zeus hasn't looked as comfortable as Broken Blade in these top lane getting four man dove situations. So it's a double win there. And number two, Guma should not be playing Senna a single time in this series because we know not only is he great on Senna, but that fully unlocks Kyria. So 100% ban rate Senna. And just after the whole segment that we talked about Cassante, expect to see Cassante falling through in this series as well. Is one of those things. Probably that, every game. <laughs> because if you're saying no Senna for Guma, well, there's one of those three right off the bat that you got to be taking care of, got to be eliminating from that. 
And then you got to really picture what you're taking out away from T1 at that point, what you think is the valuable one, what is the meta, what is the, you know, all these type of things will play into it for G2. You got to come in through strong. It's got to be the one for me, and I've got to be looking down to the bottom lane as well and saying, we need a vintage Hansama performance. We need the Hansama that has built himself up to be the most successful, most lethal ADC that Europe has ever seen. This has got to be it right now. This performance is stepping up for G2 against T1. And you need a level up from what we were getting in both spring and winter out of Yike. Because even if Owner isn't in that peak, one of the best junglers in the world form, he's still pretty damn good and Yike needs to be leveling up. And we need to see Yike on some of these pocket picks that we've seen him dominate games on. I, th I think, again, it's not necessarily fully comparable, but you have to look at and, again, understand what happened when Canyon picked the Kha'Zix against T1 in that ch uh, championship series, knowing that, yes, that had that effect, that gamble on yourself, that X factor in your champion pool. I know it's not the same to say that Yike can do just what Canyon does. Of, of course, no one's crazy like that. But having that ability to play these unique champions when it's not necessarily the one that's fitting either in the draft or the meta and make it a problem for the enemy team where it then does become something you want to sort out through the draft, either picking it, banning it, whatever. That is something that Yike brings to the table. And I think he can still bring to the table, even if it is the LCK's T1 on the other side of it. And truthfully, I think there's multiple guys on G2 that can force a ban with the single champion we've seen broken blade do it yike has done it with multiple guys caps can have a pocket pick that comes out even han sama draven i feel like even the lck and lpl teams respect so if g2 can kind of build up some of these bands uh you know one-off bands against players then they can start building some spicy comps and the real ticket is going to be getting that one game. You need to get that one game at the very least to throw it off, to make that shakeup happen. Early to bring in the some... series. That's what we always say with these underdogs. You got to win one of the first two. You got to win. Exactly. Because if you don't, you don't bring in that type of question, that type of doubt, that type of hesitation towards T1, then you're letting them be far too comfortable. And when they're far too comfortable, it's autopilot. They're going to find a way to make sure that they're not making too many mistakes and they're capitalizing on your mistakes. And that's always a quick ticket to the next to the next series for uh, NA or EU team. We did see some leaked BLG versus G2 scrim. So maybe the scrim god status has been pulled back a little bit for G2, but maybe that'll work out better for them uh, on the actual stage games to have those expectations lowered just a little bit. We're talking about the Dignitas licorice coming back to the lcs well now they're going one further for a cloud nine reunion and we are getting the return of zven not as a support but he's coming back as an ad carry alongside his former c19 teammate licorice and i'm pretty sure 2021 worlds was the last time we saw zven starting as an adc oh man i don't i don't know what you're talking about we're getting we're getting Neils down in the I, bottom I would name lane. change if I was him. You know, reset the whole thing. Should, it, should, it, it should be just kind of like, you know, how you had Kobe, and then you had the Black Mamba. You got to separate them out. Make make it that one. There was there was support Sven. Now you are Neils. Back into the ADC, back into the carry roll position. I'm excited about this one. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, had mixed feelings overall about the transition to support for Sven, and not necessarily about the results, because of how you felt about him still as an ADC and what you felt he could offer and what was still there for him as a potential player and what the landscape was in the LCS and where you thought that he could fit into it. So happy to see him get this opportunity now. I think a little bit later than a lot of us expected or would have wanted type of thing and understanding that part of that is finding the right landing spot. Is this the right landing spot? All these type of things. At the very least, you have that comfort, as you mentioned, Licorice reuniting with the Cloud9 uh, teammate at that point and talking about what Licorice, you know, is going to do for this Dignitas team. Having a player like Sven, that accomplishment, that veteran status, that knowledge, that is a big part of what you want to add to a Dignitas team. And having a now even more vocal Sven because he's been playing a support and been a bigger part of communication because with a couple of young guys in XU and Isles, there was extra pressure on Licorice, especially when the mid laner is Dove and probably the communication 
isn't quite to the other level of the other players. So I think important to bring another veteran who's going to be a strong voice. And we know Sven is a very strong voice. Yes, he is. And it's, it's good. That's a good voice that you're going to have for the Stigman Hus team. And, and especially one with authority that's going to have direction for them is a big point. I think a lot of people would say and, and uh, you know, take the, the gist of looking at Dignitas and sometimes questioning whether they had any direction and purpose in this type of one. You've got Sven on this lineup. You've got him on your team. You better believe there's going to be some direction. There's going to be some focus on what that goal is and how you have to work to achieve it. This is a good step up for Dignitas, one of the teams that was already, you know, still providing a competitive level in the LCS, more so than I think our initial expectations were were of them heading into this year so these type of moves big fan happy to see and you know truthfully i feel like tomo who's ven is replacing there's been moments he's still a young player that we've seen slowly progress he's had a few splits now in the lcs i think he's still a starting lcs caliber 80 carry and it seems risky because again Sven hasn't played this role in like two years so we're just assuming he can get back into that form but I think that's a risk you're willing to take as Dignitas. Number one, for fans, I think more people are going to be interested in this squad with Sven there. And yeah, again, the leadership qualities that Sven bring makes me understand why they made this move. I, I think if, if you're Dignitas and you would have keep, kept Tomo in this situation and hope to keep building on what you had from spring moving into summer, it would be okay, but it wouldn't line up to what the rest of this statement was when you were announcing that they're signing Sven or the rumors coming through about it, is that this is Dignitas setting their sights to make worlds this year, that type of goal. And where they finished out, uh, you know, in spring split and where they need to be for summer split to make sure that that is what is happening, making a, a move like bringing in Sven and betting that you are going to get some of that OG Niels type of skill and talent down in the bottom lane. That is a, a, certainly a gamble, but one of those gambles that will pay out enough to get you to a world's position type of thing, where I don't know if you're gambling on Tomo's continued development and improvement, if you would have seen that on this Dignitas roster. The classic LCS race to go winless at the world championship. <laughs> but that is all the time today. For League Unlock, Eric and Mark here with you, Beauty. Thanks for hanging out. We'll catch you on that flippity flip.